Well, hello there, my brothers and sisters. It's Josh Packard. Welcome to another episode of The Golden Image of Churchianity is a Lie. Thank you for joining me today. If this is your first time, welcome. Today, as with every day, I want to let you know that there is a deception that is over the eyes and the hearts of men. It's always been there. It's been, it's over from the poorest to the richest, from the sinner to the saint, to everything and everyone that has walked since the time of the deception, since Adam and his fall. Everything in that, since that time has been underneath a delusion, a complete lie. All systems of worship, all systems of philosophies, all the ideas that we have in our heads about right and wrong, heaven, hell, uh, the afterlife, uh, what anything could possibly be about. Our conceptions are so wrong. The picture in our mind about what is going on and what's valuable, what would matter even to God is completely wrong. It's, it's, we have all these cathedrals, we have all these churches, we have all these denominations, we have all this stuff and it's worshiping nothing. I mean, it's not nothing. It's really Satan and your self-righteousness. But as far as God is concerned, you have not even scraped the surface. You haven't even approached. You haven't even gotten near to God yet. No, nah, nobody. This is... Once you see how deep the deception is, you'll be floored. And just to give you a picture and to show you the totality of the deception, if this what i'm about to say is the truth then everything we've known is a lie everything the purposes of our systems our institutions our deductions our opinions everything that we do is based on a foundation of a lie that has been perpetuated upon man by great orchestration by not only satan the fallen angels demons but also fallen humans that perpetuated upon each other and on their own children on their families and everyone they love or claim to love because we don't know what love is because we hand our children over to satan every day not realizing it we hand them over to destruction not realizing it we do it every day all the time without fail while patting ourselves on the back like we're doing something good Christ was slain from the foundation of the world. Okay, what we saw 2,000 years ago on the cross is only the testimony of what already had been done. When Christ comes again, is he going to change? He's unchanging, he's unwavering. This entire time, this whole thing, the whole sham has been in our own minds. That we, in our consciences, will not let ourselves up from sin. That we would prefer darkness rather than light. We'd rather have our control and our right in our own minds rather than yield unto the, the mercy and the truth and the grace of our God. And then we'd have to take our hands off everyone else's throats too because in the idea that I say that somebody else goes to hell because I'm, I've done something that they haven't done, well, I bear that judgment on myself not realizing it. And I teach other people to do the same thing and, and bear that judgment and to, to extend that judgment um, going about to fulfill the great commission using the threat of hell and shame and guilt and fear in order to try to convert someone to my cause. But if somebody converts out of fear, they've only conformed to the accusation of the enemy. They are fallen from grace and they are separated from God, though they're going to church. See, the, the church system is only light Luciferian. Um, so we know the dark Luciferians, all your sinners that we're all aware of, that everybody points at them and says, oh, we don't want to be like them. Those are the evil ones. And then we have the good Christian ones. And then, so then the, the sinners and the, and the Christians are always going back and forth. And I'm using Christians loosely. This is all religions, but, um, it just, we are familiar with this likely because you're, you know, you know what we're talking about, but. Anyways, they seem to be at odds with each other, and they bicker and bicker and fight and fight and fight and bicker and bicker, and I'm more righteous than you. No, I'm more righteous than you. You know, it, it just keeps going back and forth. There's no settling. Um, both heads, though, work for Satan, not realizing it. Um, see, the sinner just has no conscience of 
right or wrong anyway. They've kind of lost their concepts. Uh, but the religious is even worse because though they have their concepts of right and wrong, um, the very things they condemn others for, they they either do or think in their heart. or it, it, It's just this whole convoluted mess of self-righteousness that causes division. Um, the churches and the fact that you see churches right across the street from each other um, shows that they are at division with each other. Um, you would think if they were truly trying to advance God's cause and not their own, then they would lend their money, time, and resources into the church that already existed, right? Rather than building a brand new one right across the street, right? Where pastors can't... So, let's say like a, a First Assemblies of God pastor, they won't let him preach in a Baptist church. Why? Because their doctrines vary so much, and the pride on both sides won't allow that to happen. And it might. There might be an, an, uh, you know, an aberration every now and then where they might invite some, old, some pastor over from another church to preach. But doctrinally speaking, and according to um, their rules and regulations, um, they're, those people are inadequate according to their doctrine. So it's, it stands directly opposed whenever you say that someone has to be baptized correctly and they're not. And it stands directly opposed to you say that someone has to speak in tongues to believe or to be saved or not or show forth the fruits of the gifts. You know, you have to... You, you keep going down through all these stipulations that divide and uh, denominate. And uh, each one of those reasons serves Satan. Not only that, by us being so divided and uh, manifesting the beast of Satan, because each one of us going our own direction, trying to serve our own ideas of righteousness makes so if we call claim to be the body of Christ we're just like an am amalgamated uh, amoeba that's just like a blob that goes blah 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 because you see everybody trying to be hands and everybody's trying to be feet and everybody's trying to be the mouth and everybody's trying to be the all pretty parts well you know there's still there's lots of other things that God needs he needs assholes and there's lots of assholes out there that think they're sinners there's a lot of bad people that God uh, wants because the bad people will do things the good people won't do. And so God takes both the good and the bad and uses them for his own, his own glory. But as long as you're still according to the system of the world, the knowledge of good and evil, still being light Luciferian or dark Luciferian, you are still working for the enemy no matter what you do. But those who us, of us who have escaped that system, whether bad or good, we both serve God. We're both, we're all, we're all vessels for noble uses and ignoble uses, whatever God needs us to do, okay? Um, when you escape the knowledge of good and evil, all the burdens and all the fears and all the chains and shackles and all the, the, the gravity trying to force you in and conform you to a specific idea according to what righteousness is you're being compressed into a little tiny little box and and the thing is, is the more you're compressed the more your God is this little bitty little God and that's not our God our God's massive he is beyond comprehension you know when you walk with the Lord you're constantly going what the heck's going on you know um, I watched the movie The Shack last night, um, and the book is really good. You know, I don't agree with everything in it, but as far as the pictures and the ideas of God's heart towards us, it's a very, very good book. Uh, in the movie, I didn't give it a fair shake because I'd probably just read the book, and I, I watched the movie, and I was like, ah, you know. After, compared to the book, the movie isn't quite up to par, but uh, I watched the movie last night, and I mean, I bawled like a little baby. I mean, it's it's so good. It's so rich. If people could see what's going on there, it's such a, to see the heart of God, that is such a good, good, good tool for people. But uh, there's a part on there where God calls him an idiot. And he says, did I just get called an idiot by God? And God's like, oh, the shoe fits. You betcha. You know, kind of a thing. And it's like, our relationship with God, it's like Jacob. He had to wrestle. He had to wrestle that man. He had to wrestle him until morning, and he wouldn't let him go until he blessed him. You have to know, 
God is big enough to take your insults, to take your anger, to take everything. If, if you can't release that stuff, if you can't be genuine and honest with anyone on the earth, you've got to be genuine and honest with the Lord. Okay? He sees everything, you guys. You don't, you can't hide from Him. He's already seen your inside and out, every part of you for your entire life. And He has called you worthy in the fact that He died on your behalf. He has not excluded you. He never will exclude you. You will never shock Him away. It will never happen. And until this is settled with you, until you can see that your salvation and your rescuing had nothing to do with you and never did. He didn't ask your permission to go to the cross. That had nothing to do with you. You think you have free will for salvation? No, you don't. You don't have free will for shit. Because first off, your will was dominated by sin. So you might have free choice, but inside of sin and the dominion of sin, and your your so your knowledge is being darkened. You're only given a limited type tiny little bit of knowledge you don't have enough to work with to have free will okay you don't you have free choice but if you're a, if you're lied to all your choices serve that lie it's a deception so no matter what even though you're doing good deeds you're still under the deception and you replicate that deception in those that are underneath you whether they be other believers or your own children your own family and you hand them over to the devil and you hand them over to destruction because you separate them from the one who would give them life and comfort and hope and peace. It is my greatest hope for my children that they know the love of God. That they can see that nothing could ever separate them, that it is never based upon them. It had nothing to do with them. It was just God loved them. Satan's so active in his deception and his disciples being those that are religious, they're the worst, you guys. It's not in God's kingdom, the religious are the worst. They're the they're beyond the homosexuals and, and lesbians and whatever. They're beyond the murderers and rapists. They're beyond these things. The, the religious are the more vile before God because they're the ones that actually cause his people to stumble. He causes the sheep they cause the sheep to go to astray. They cause people to be reliant upon their own devices and capabilities. They teach people to listen to the accusation of the enemy. They teach people to, to try to fix themselves and to focus on their guilt and shame and sin, not realizing. Because with their lips, they'll say, well, Jesus saved you. But then they'll be focused constantly on their trying to do Christian deeds and doing these things, trying to please God. And they'll come up, oh, no, we don't, no, we don't, no, we don't. We, we talk just about Christ. We're biblically sound. And it's like, no, you're not. You might be biblically sound. You might be preaching verbatim through the scripture. You might be, but you're preaching from the wrong spirit. You don't believe Christ saved you. Otherwise, you would still wouldn't be worried about your sin, death, and hell. You wouldn't. You don't believe he saved the world because they. You still believe they're going to go to sin, death, and hell. And your impetus for all your preaching and everything you do is to save these lost sinners. Even though heaven isn't the goal anymore, it never was. It has nothing to do with God's plan. He's already accomplished that for us all but on the cross, and you're still fighting for a battle that has already been won. So then, in your doing that, you deny that it's been won. Not only that. I mean, if you want to take it to the end of the end of the nth degree, it, Christ was slain before anything was created, and there's nothing that's outside of His mercy. Not even Satan. Everything shall bow, whether you like it or not. It has nothing to do with you. This everything we know and everything we've been told is a complete lie to keep us in a rat wheel, so that we cannot perform the works of God, so that we cannot be employed into His kingdom that we cannot enforce his will upon this earth because we're so ravaged in our own consciences that we are so busy looking at ourselves and trying to get ourselves right because we don't believe that he made us right and then we're also focused on getting these other people to heaven well they've already been purchased it has nothing to do with going to heaven now we need to focus on the reconciliation of all of everything the Christ's body be manifest in us corporately, that we are his image on this earth so that everything will see that he is to be worshipped. So this all could be over. 
We know it's all according to due, due timing. But the thing is, is that we will at some point be um, the, the vehicle by which God executes his judgment upon all this earth and upon all the fallen creatures and the demons and everything. He, there will become a real-time event to where we will overcome death. That we will overcome all the works of the enemy right in front of everything to see through the, just the knowledge of him who loved us and washed us in his own blood. For the love and the mercy and the tenderness and the kindness of our God who loves without expectation. One who exalts us because it doesn't diminish him to do so. The one that brings us to fellowship with him. The one that created us to be loved and to, and to love. That everything that we've been doing, we're focused in the wrong direction entirely. And Satan is just giggling. Oh, we're going to spiritual warfare. And Satan's all... As he's using you as cannon fodder against God. Watching God restrain himself and not destroy his children. Okay? So Satan is taking God's own children, twisting them and using them against his other children. To where God, he's trying to put God in the position to where he has to destroy some to save others. And God's like, screw that. I'll send myself. I'll make their payment. I'll do it. I'm not going to let any of them be lost. And not only that, he doesn't just love us. He loves all of his creation. He loves Satan, the demons. He loves the you know everything. There's nothing outside. Okay? Though we see it as it because we want to be the judge. We want to determine who goes to heaven or hell by our own conception. We want to exalt ourselves above God and make make our opinions known. I mean, Hitler's such a great example because everybody's like, oh, that guy deserves hell. Well, that's not for you to say. You have no... You have no idea of what it takes to deserve hell. Once you see how much you deserve hell, you might not be so quick to judge. You know, it sucks. I don't excuse what he did. He was evil. God doesn't excuse what he did. He was evil. All the atrocities on this earth, God doesn't excuse them. They will. Everyone will be punished according to the right measure to what God needs. Because he's about the redemption of everything. He's about redeeming those whom he's loved and who he's lost. And he's bringing them back. And there's nothing we can do about it. It will happen. The scriptures are so clear about it. It is not even funny. Yet we just, oh, those sinners. Oh, so we got to go out and reach those people. They're lost. Nothing's lost. Never has been, never will be. Christ was slain from the foundation of the world. He died for the sins of the whole world. Well, what about death and hell? Well, he went down to the belly of the earth and he absolutely overcame death and hell. So they're no longer uh, not God's kingdom. Let's put it that way. Everything is his. Whether you like it or not, you've been saved. Whether you like it or not, your neighbor has been saved. Whether you like it or not, everything's been saved. I Trust me. I mean, if someone hurts my daughter or my son, so I, I will torture them. I mean, I'll beat them. I mean, you don't understand what I would do to them if you put me in a room with them. I mean, you know, I would rip them limb from limb. And I would snap their fingers. One I mean, I would be do brutal things to them. You know, and that would be a part of the consequence of their sin. But um, I understand. They deserve that. But even then, it's not my place to judge them for her death. Because it would be her place to judge them. And I can't see my little daughter watching, knowing that someone had been twisted and abused and molested themselves. And um, blind and, and just inside themselves. And then even though what they did to her would be atrocious, but do you think she could sit there and watch them being tortured and be ripped apart knowing the truth of what had happened to them too? I don't. I can't even see that. My daughter's evil. I mean, I'm evil. My daughter's evil. On the scale of truth, she is, and she and herself would never even allow that. It would. Her little heart wouldn't allow that to happen, if it was up to her. And I look at God and how much more He loves the world and He loves each of us more than you can. I mean, more than we can imagine. He doesn't. 
he doesn't look at our individual deeds. He looks at the whole scope of our existence. He doesn't look at, he doesn't focus in on your, it, it, it's just we, we're so wrong in what we think. We are such the judges. And then in our judgment of others, we bear that judgment upon ourselves. And, and we, miss, we, we apply and project that onto our God, thinking that that's the way he is. But then because you're focused in, in, in that way, you can't actually see him for what he is. And your whole narrative is wrong. So then, so then the Lord has to wash that all clean and you have to see his mercy on those that are the worst to see that you've been included no matter what. So that you can finally dust yourself off, unpack and take your chains off and let your bonds be burned. You know what I mean? So that you can be free. And then rather than focusing on everything that's negative. See, part of the shack, there's a point where he's, they finally find the daughter's body and they take him and they, they put her in a coffin and they bury him in this garden, which is, is Mackenzie's heart, the guy's heart, where he was, at first it was killing him and strangling him. Well, you know, they, they take and they drop that, um, her, her, her grave in there and they, they take this vial full of his tears and they water it and up comes this beautiful tree in the garden. And it's the only beautiful tree in the garden. But it, my wife's like, what's going on there? And we're talking about it. And we're like, well, it seems to me is that the place that was the most broken, when God heals it, becomes the greatest memory and the greatest, you know. Because in the book it talks about how he was just so grateful. Rather than being so angry and focusing on what he lost and how much, and how much injustice it was and how much in this, he he turned and looked and rather was grateful for the time that he had her. He didn't let his pain tarnish his memory of her. And that's that's just such a good picture, is is that we're being robbed every single day by by our fear, our guilt, our strangulation of other people, our our are being forced to look at the dis the despair and the, everything that's wrong is where we're looking all the time rather than what everything that is right and everything that is blessed and holy we're 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 losing the enjoyment of our life because Satan is getting us to look at everything wrong rather than focusing on the joy so anyway we had my daughter my daughter's birthday party yesterday and we had a, just a large group of good people and we were just we're just enjoying it. And, I mean, we went for, like, freaking eight hours, you know. And typically, you know, birthday parties last a couple hours and everybody goes home and does what they want. But there was a group of us that just hung out. We laid in the grass. We picked up and cleaned up and just kind of laid in the grass, talked, watched the kids, glorified God, you know. Just kind of just had a real just nice, just chilling experience. And it's just so good to remember these times. And they just take the time to enjoy each other and to fellowship and talk about what's going on and what matters in your life and talk about the good things going on um but anyway anyway i just we've so much has been stolen from us we just we gotta we can't let the stealer steal no more so much has been robbed and we don't you know what i mean all this stuff that we're looking at all the what ifs and the fears we're wearing ourselves out for the time that should be spent with those we love you know and it's definitely i mean i'm not saying because we're not going to get completely out of this fight i mean we gotta you still need to vote you still need to bring god's kingdom on the earth and to show his wisdom you can't just sit by idly and you know um expect the you know god to just change everything he uses you and works through you through your own mind and through your own understanding to enforce his will once you're free you 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 still need to be a citizen okay a good citizen but don't let him steal him him that steals steal anymore okay um i'm going to talk to you um there's in second corinthians 11 he's warning people about the false teachers and you know, you're if you're preaching the truth, you're going to be called a false teacher. I've been called a false prophet, 
everyone is warned to stay away from me. I, I hear all this stuff because people, as soon as they hear the truth, they go, er, they put on their brakes and they're like, oh, screw you. I'm not doing what you're doing anymore, right? And a lot of times people have to figure out their freedom. And so they go off and do rat like stupid shit trying to touch the bounds of God's grace, what he's, what he's doing. You know what I mean? It's kind of a natural response because you're so oppressed for so long. Then all of a sudden that oppression has gone boop. And you're like, oh, what do I do? And so you kind of, you're, you, 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 bing, bing, you kind of dart about, um, trying to find your bearing and you're, you know what I mean? You're trying to find a new heading because what you you'd known so far had been to be so oppressed and to be your your whole goal was to kind of fit yourself inside of this little christian bubble you know what i mean that's what you're trying to force yourself into force yourself into to look like a christian act like a christian talk right say the right things and that's all you're focusing on well once you see all that is like worthless now you've got it you're you've been brought back into the expanse and now you're like what now what do i do right and so you're you 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 go and you test grace. You, you most people do. You can't help it. You're gonna go out and do it. Well, then all of a sudden the Christians are like, oh, I'm so worried about him. It's because of that false teacher and blah 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 blah. Well, you, it is. Thank you. But um, it's no. It's because they are they have been so oppressed. It's like a springboard. They're like a an arrow. They they it's like they don't know what to do. But God will bring them back into control. He always does. He did it to me. He did it to Nick. I know for sure. Nick <laughs> Nick can tell you stories that would blow your mind. Um, ask him about a rattlesnake at some point um, and other things. I mean, he, Nick's got a pretty remarkable life. I mean, he he looks like he's a he's just a, a cowboy. He looks he always got that beard like a wild man. But Nick has a wild ride in his past. He's not like a you would. It's funny. There's always a whirlwind around that dude. I mean, it's funny. And. Uh, Anyway, but I did it too. I went out and tested the bounds of grace. I went down. I went and partied and went nuts. I mean, once I figured it out, I was like, I could do this. I can do this. And God's like, oh, yeah, you can do anything. Um, but you find out really quickly, if you abuse your, that grace, then God will just take away your satisfaction, take away your joy. You can have what you think you want, but it will just turn to ashes in your mouth. And I mean quick. And then you're going to be learned. You're going to learn to... Be regulated by the Holy Spirit. What nourishes you, and what quenches you? You're you're going to start following these. You're going to be following the signpost. It's like a stop sign and a go sign. You know, you're you you're literally being led um, by being full or empty. That's all you're doing. You just you're going. It's like you're you've got a Geiger counter, and it's like and that's the way to go. And you're like ding 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 ding. There's nothing over here. You're like ah, I don't want to go that way. You're like. And you're like, Phew, that's the way I go. That's the way I go. So you're being, you're being actually controlled by your spirit, and your spirit is righteousness, holiness, and peace. So you're seeking that which fills you all the time. It's really crazy. Um, I play guitar, uh, not well, but um, I know how to tune a guitar, and and it's like whenever it's like it's like that experience to me is when you're you're all and it hits and you know right when you're in tune right when you when you're you're stringing out your string you know when you're you're tuning your strings you can you can tell whenever they come into harmony and it, it the vibration hits i mean for me that's how i can I, I can explain it is the vibration hits the right um tone and i can hear it go right into that tone right well it's always been like that with me the scriptures as well or people preaching to me or anything because i have i had the first experience like God showed me the burning bush first. He said he showed me everything about me, showed me, brought me, showed me, and I was shameful of my own accord. He didn't shame me, but he showed me everything I was, the truth of it. And I went, Ew, that's me. Ugh. And I was just ashamed. And then he he said, and I was expecting a hammer. Like literally, I'm, I was expecting him to just annihilate me because that's what I've been told, right? Sinners go to hell, right? Liars, lovers of a lie, fornicators, adulterers, whoremongers. Me, go to hell, right? And rather than that, um, he said, uh, I love you. One second, free. It's taken me years to figure out what he did that day and just that one time. 
I'm still probably barely scraping the surface of it. But um, now everything everything is going to be judged against that moment now. Everything goes... So if anything goes, uh, that doesn't work. That doesn't. That's bullshit. I can tell you right now, it doesn't. It does not fit with that. And it's kind of like the the burning bush with Moses. Whenever God showed him the first thing, the burning bush. Well, once you find out that you know Christ is the vine, we are the branches. That you know, see the tree of life. You see everything, but the fact that it's on fire and not consumed. That should give you some great hope, because Christ baptizes with the fire, folks. So, you're. Everything that is natural, everything that is man-made on you will be destroyed. Everything false, every lie, everything will be exposed. There's no, this is what the judgment will happen to you, but that will be freedom. You understand? What are you doing, dog? So, the fire of judgment is to free you. It's to show you God's heart and his mind, to put you in his position, to reveal to you that you've been the judge. You have not let God be God. You have you have demanded Him to be as you expect, and that doesn't work. And then everyone in the world is also demanding God to be what they expect. You got to understand. And then these ideas and ideas of righteousness they conflict one with another, and then it just keeps extrapolating and becoming magnified and growing bigger and bigger into bigger and bigger divides where wars come from, where divorces, where broken families, where everything comes from this division. You guys. And it's because we misunderstand and we misconceive of who God is and what he's after. We have no um, no knowledge, zero. And then every knowledge that every bit of knowledge we have is according to a false narrative. So, you know, and you know, the guys like John MacArthur or, you know, Greg Laurie or all these other guys. And they sound knowledgeable and they sound like they're doing everything, but their entire preaching is according to a false narrative. Completely false. So though they have lots of biblical knowledge and they're really astute in their doctrines, it's still according to the lie. It's kind of like someone who's like way into Tolkien, you know what I mean? And they know they know Elvin and they know they know Elvish and they know every little thing of what's going on in this entire community and they they're totally versed and they understand what each person means and everything and they're everything but they're still just in Tolkien. They're still in that little imaginary world. They're still in a narrative even though they've know everything about it. All that is just wasted on imagination. It's the same thing with those that study and, and espouse the scriptures. They are very intelligent. They're, they've spent lots of time. They've, they've done all these things, but they started in the wrong position. They're just in the wrong place, looking at the wrong narrative, trying to explain things from the scriptures, trying to match their narrative, rather than letting God be God and show you his narrative. Which, if you look at the cross, I mean, just look at the cross. Just that day, I mean, we. I mean, all of it together. But just that day, and whenever, who was crucifying him? It was the whole world. <clears throat> who did he ask to forgive? The whole world. Everybody was in rebellion to him when he forgave them. There was nobody that was on his side. No one. The apostles split on him. Everybody was gone. There, there nobody. Pontius Pilate knew that he was an innocent man, but he still did it to appease the religious again. You guys gotta understand, he forgave us all. There's nothing left. Okay? There are punishments, that's true. But the punishment isn't for your destruction. Punishment always has the idea with it for reconciliation. If you, punishment and destruction are two different things. If you're gonna destroy something, you're gonna, you know, dismantle it and, and vaporize it, right? It's gone. But if you're punishing somebody, it's for the purpose of their reconciliation. It's not what we think it is. And no matter what, God's righteousness is God's righteousness. And if at all in eternity we step out of it, we will suffer consequences. It's just the way it is. No sin goes unpunished. God is the one who, is, who, who brings vengeance. That is not what we worry about. We want to expel all the poison from us. We want to forgive everyone we can. We want to just completely turn away from all the negativity and then then spend our time completely um, focusing on what's right and what's good with everything. 
so that we can be with our families, that we can enjoy ourselves, that we don't let the, the, the stain of the world stain our heart and the poison, that we don't keep drinking poison trying to fix something. It doesn't work that way. You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit and then let the light shine on the darkness, you guys. All right. Well, I didn't get to the scriptures I wanted to go to today, but anyway. Uh, anyway. The narrative is wrong. Everything in the narrative is wrong. And then when you try to to reconcile the Bible with your false narrative, y- you can find parts of it. You can you can kind of make stuff work, but when you see the whole thing, you go, "Well, that doesn't work." Your your narrative is still trying to get to heaven. That's already been done. So you're denying that that what Christ did, you denied what Christ did. You're still trying to get the Great Commission out there, trying to save the world. Well, Christ has already saved the world. You're wasting your time doing nothing. It's not about getting to heaven. Never has been, never would be. It's not about being good. Light and darkness. There's light, light and dark Luciferian. That's it. Done. God is over here. The, the truth, the tree of life. He is not in the knowledge of good and evil. That's, that's where you are held captive. Okay, all of churchianity, all of every church, your church, every single one is underneath this system. Not because they're bad, but it's because they're in the false, wrong narrative. Okay, all right, you guys, that's was enough for today. But uh, God bless you all, and uh, you are loved more than you could ever imagine. All right, see you.